Szanowni Państwo, nasz dzisiejszy gość mówi, że architektura nie opiera się wcale na betonie, metalu, minerałach, ale na zachwycie. Powitajmy go gorąco brawami przed Państwem Daniel Libeskind. Dobry wieczór. Once again, welcome uh, to Warsaw. Uh, I have to say that the crowd is electrified with your presence as well as with your buildings. I'm very happy to host you here tonight in Warsaw. Uh, well, dear sir, the floor is yours. Dziękuję bardzo. Naprawdę jestem naprawdę e, zakochany jestem w Polsce, w Warszawie, ale to, ten e, talk muszę e, zrobić po angielsku, bo słowa mi brakują. To na wszyscy, na, na, na wszyscy przyszły raz będę mówić po polsku. <laughs> Dziękuję. Przecież ja wyjechałem z Polski, e, miałem 11 lat. To długo czasu temu, nie mam teraz z kim mówić. Mówiłem z małą, z tatą, e, teraz nie mogę. To muszę przyjechać jeszcze raz do Polski. Kilka razy. <laughs> Uh, I want to share with you uh, really a path uh, in architecture, my path, which is not by starting to build. Uh, you know, for many years, I drew. That was my inspiration. I didn't have clients. I didn't ever uh, indulge in fantasy drawings. So I drew my idea of architecture, which is not really a fantasy, but a kind of structure, which is in these drawings, which were first drawings that I produced when I started really thinking, what could I build? And I called them micromegas. They were dedicated to, to Voltaire, the idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm connected through the city and space. And you can see that these drawings were very systematic. Uh, they were done really uh, in pencil first, then in ink, in very, very classical way. And these drawings took me to destinations I did not know I would encounter. So the, my next destination were the machines. As you know, in the old classical books of Vitruvius, he says if you want to be an architect, first you have to draw, second you have to build machines. Now my machines were built for the Venice Biennale where I actually won the Lion of Venice and they were machines to design a city. First machine was called the reading machine. I produced a gigantic wheel, a wooden wheel, a kind of medieval sense of, of the return of the circle also, I wrote the eight books, each one based on a single word of our time. And I produced everything by hand. Everything was made by hand. It was not made by machines. It was made, let's say, in the medieval spirit of hands, candlelight, work on something that returns. My second machine was called the memory machine. This is really more about the renaissance of the mind, the puppets in the mind, the emblems, the memories, the mnemonic devices in architecture. And it's full of all sorts of devices that I was fascinated with that, to me, are the memory that is necessary to have in order to build a city. And my third one was my own attempt at a writing machine, a writing of architecture machine, which was turned by, you know, 49 handles, uh, different in a kind of chaotic manner, but with the result that each of these faces of these turning and uh, disassembled spaces were connected through sainthood, you know, through the divine, through a mirror that reflected the sky, through an emblem of an imaginary city, and through a connection to science and architecture. So these were kind of the three machines, reading, writing, remembering. That took me to still another set of drawings because I really work through drawings, especially when you have no clients. What are you going to do? Uh, so, uh, you know, I started my life in music. My second uh, really attempt to follow the path was through a series of drawings I called chamber works. Uh, you know, music and architecture are really the same art. They're, they're connected in a very deep way. And so I created a kind of a score to be performed by architecture and by planning of a city. Now this drawing too might look very abstract and very useless and sort of sort of just to be hanging on the wall. But believe me, 
I've always used these drawings, and I continue to use these drawings. They're kind of a little treatise on cities, a little treatise on architecture, not so different, in my mind, from the greatest of architects, Andrea Palladio, who created a little sort of encyclopedia for himself, not a, probably not a single building in that uh, Palladian book has ever been built properly, but it was an idea of architecture. So you can see the drawings uh, form different horizons. Uh, vertical horizons, which I cannot show, horizontal horizons, and open into spaces that both recede and also come forward. So that's uh, music, music and architecture in creating a city. And by the way, I'm doing now a project in Frankfurt, which will happen next May, which gives people the chance to explore the city through music in places where music was never played and people had never had a chance to go to those places. Like, for example, in the operating room of the hospital or in the stadium of Frankfurt or in the bunker that is deeply hidden in the city. That set of drawings, chamber works, took me to the stage. And I designed a number of stages. So this is a stage for Wagner, and not a very orthodox Wagnerian stage for Tristan and Isoldi. Later on, I was invited by the Deutsche Oper not just to create the sets and the costume, but to direct a fantastic opera by Messiaen, Saint, Fra, Saint Fra Francis of Assisi. It's a fantastic mystical opera, inspired also by Wagner. And I created, you, know, you can see the larger machinery of the stage, which was mobile, computer controlled. Something uh, really that took me to still further investigations in my stage set for Luigi Nono, the great Italian composer, Intoleranza, Intolerance, uh, where I also uh, sought to create a space through the theatrics, through the music, and through the opera. That took me to a more recent group of drawings. I call them Sonnets in Babylon because they deal with Shakespeare. My, my, one of my loves is the Sonnets of Shakespeare, but also the idea of Babylon. And these are 101 drawings. I just show you a couple of these drawings, which took me to still another set of, of things to build. And these are large scale urban sculptures. This one is uh, on the Lake of Como, Lago di Como, uh, in Italy. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a jetty that projects itself into the middle of the lake. And I was able to build this sculpture, stainless steel, which is a sculpture dedicated to Andrea Volta, the inventor of the battery, who invented the battery, of course, using the Lake of Como. So it's a, it's a, it's a gateway, it's a new gateway to a very historical city. And it's a, it's, a, it's a reflective sculpture, a sculpture that creates a public space in a place where public space did not exist. And more recently, near Modena in northern Italy, I created another public sculpture, uh, created it in terms of bringing people together, giving light to a space that was just kind of an abandoned space between roads. And uh, I, of course, worked on this with a company that created uh, a tile uh, for me, with me, that is a new sustainable tile. Later on, I had a good opportunity to work in one of the oldest Renaissance buildings in Milan, Italy. It's the, it's the old uh, hospital by Filaretta, which is now the, the, the school, the Università di Milano. And I was able to create a project called Future Flowers. Really, I think a lot about what will future flowers look like? What is the future of flowers? And what is the role of architecture and urban design in creating a sense of nature? And also, I had a good chance because I developed this very special red for the company that sponsored it. I love red, by the way. It's my favorite color, together with white and black. Uh, but uh, I was able to create a palette of colors and feature this really new sense of the interaction between the traditional space, Renaissance space, and a contemporary sensibility. Just very recently, I was able to build with those incredible tiles, which contain titanium that transforms carbon dioxide into oxygen. So it's a three-dimensional new tile uh, this pavilion in the Milan Expo, Expo di Milano, which was created for one of the largest companies in the world, the Chinese company, Vanke, which is a real estate and building company. And it really, I didn't start with a dragon, but properly, it became a dragon. And the dragon, of course, is the people of China. That's the dragon. So that's another project that took me to finally design objects. Now, 
you know, I never thought of designing object, but it was my son, Lev Liebeskind, when he opened a studio in Milan, said to me, why don't you design? Why haven't you ever designed any objects? For so many years, I never thought about it. And then a client came to me, and Lev said, why don't you design a door handle? And I said, that's ridiculous. You know, how am I going to design a door handle? But then I thought about it, why not? There are so many doors in the world. Then I thought of my wife, Nina, who's here. I said, she opens so many doors, so I called it the Nina door handle. And that was my first design product, really. And then uh, another client came to me and said, Mr. Libeskin, we saw that you designed a door handle. Why don't you design a door? I said, ah, that's a very good idea. Now a door handle and a door, and so on. And so I'm having now so much fun designing things that you know, are part of industrial design, uh, design of object, design of architecture. This is uh, a Zohar lamp. Zohar is a great book, great uh, Hebrew work, uh, mystical work, but it's also the name of my granddaughter in Milan. It's, it's a very much three-dimensional contemporary lamp that, that works with modern technology. Uh, I designed the wing, the Fiam, for Fiam. It's kind of a neo-baroque wing with these slashes through it. Comes in different sizes, uh, very, very special. And I was even able to design in the uh, uh, hall that I recently designed, the convention center in Mons in Belgium, recently opened. I was able to design the 10 gram, the chairs. It's so nice if you are able to get clients to agree that you're not only designing the shell and core, but able to design the objects, the design objects. It's a very elegant chair with a, move, with a table that comes out for a computer and for uh, participating in the talks in these large scale halls. I was also able to design even something very traditional, like a tea set. But, you know, nobody drinks tea anymore, but in my family we still drink a lot of tea. So it's nice to have a tea set. And, uh, of course, lamps are very important for the Artemida, a, a, a very simple but a flexible lamp. And I'm here actually with Yama Karim, who is uh, the principal architect also on Zwota and on Singapore, but he also was involved in the design of the torque chair and table. Uh, and very recently for Polyform, the, the, the large kind of, quote, bookcase. But, you know, people don't really need books in the same way as old, uh, you know, libraries because books are, you know, now virtual. So it's a different kind of thing to hold memories and other things, not really for storage of books. And then, really, one of my favorite uh, things, design a modern kitchen, you know, which, which has also this dramatic angle that can engage in the living space, uh, very elegant and very technologically advanced kitchen. It was not just the appearance of the kitchen, but we worked on the technology of the kitchen, on the self-cleaning aspects, on the, on, the, on the cleanliness, so how do you maintain the kitchen equipment clean and technically uh, really advanced. And most recently for Moroso, fantastic company in Milan, my favorite form is the, the kind of the crystal, but you know, it's hard to sit on a crystal because it's very hard. So I designed with Moroso a chair that has a crystalline structure, but it's made with a new fabric and a new kind of base that is, that is you kind of sink into it, but it still keeps the geometry that I love keeps the sharp angle geometry, but it's very, very comfortable to sit. And now I'm working with Moroso also on other arrangements of sofas, on airport seating, and so on. So, well, it's the beginning of a chapter. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's fun to design things like this. But let me take you really to my first project, you know, which, which didn't happen that long ago, but it was my first project, which is the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Uh, and you know, when I came to that city, you know, I didn't expect to be in Berlin. My parents are survivors of the Holocaust. I'm Jewish. You know, I didn't learn about the Holocaust in the library. I didn't learn it in, in books, in history books. I learned it just by the void in which I grew up, the emptiness, the extermination of Jews in Europe. And so when I came to Berlin and I competed in this competition, I decided to create a kind of emblematic idea of the Star of David connected by different addresses of the city and voices that you can no longer hear, but if you put your ear to the ground, you can hear the whisper of time. You can hear the spirit of time. And so the building is a very radical building. It's, it's a building with a, a very different circulation from any museum. It's really my first building, so it doesn't have anything that 
because I never designed anything before to live in, to be in. So I tried to say, this is a new idea because it's about a history that is irreversible, like here, the, 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 the horrors that befell on our country here in Poland, but also on hope, because without hope, you would never even do architecture. You wouldn't bother doing architecture. So I always say, you can be a pessimist as a composer, as a filmmaker, as an artist, as a politician, you can be a pessimist, even as an economics minister, but you cannot be a pessimist as an architect because architecture is about optimism. It's about the future. It's about doing something better for the world. So you enter the building in a very unusual way. You know, it doesn't really have a door to it. it the door is in the Baroque building, and that was my idea. You have to go underground. That's the light in the darkness. And of course, this is how strange, Litzman uh, Lodge, the city is there. It's not my idea, it's, it's the exhibition designers. But it's an it's a, it's a overture with three roads that go to three different destinations. It's very important to, 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 see, to start the, in the deep underground of the Baroque because of course bigotry, anti-Semitism, anti-humanism began at the height of the Enlightenment in Berlin with great professors like Professor Hegel, Kierkegaard, Lessing, the great writers there was an underpinning of hatred as well. So that's how we enter the museum. And then you arrive with one of those streets to a dead end. Because that I call the end of Berlin as we have known it. It's, it's now a different Berlin. It's the dead end. I call it the Holocaust Tower. And I have to tell you, it's a little anecdote for architects and designers. For all the years that I worked in this museum, I had no light in this tower. It, it was just black because I saw no light. There is no light in the Holocaust. There is nothing to me that could be illuminated in the darkness. But then I read an account of a survivor by accident in a book. And she was writing, she was uh, speaking in New York, in Brooklyn, about her experience. And she said the following. She said, you know, when I was locked into, into the cars, into these cattle cars, I saw a crack of light. And then she says, I don't know really what it was whether it was really a crack in the wood of the car or whether I saw through this crack a white plume of airplane smoke. But all I know is I held onto this light and I believe I survived because I held onto the light. I thought, yes, you have to create a light. And I did make a cut at the very tip. It's a, it's a light that is a stabbing light because it's not a light that is reflected in a space but only on a piece of wall which is up high. The second road leads to this garden. It's, I call it the Garden of Exile, because also Berlin is exiled from itself. You know, it's, it's been deported from itself. Berlin is elsewhere. Berlin is, you know, in New York, in Australia, in other places. Berlin is not in itself anymore. And this garden is very unusual. You can see the pillars. Uh, there are seven times seven, very, very biblical number, 49 pillars. The central pillar is filled with the earth of Jerusalem and 48 with the earth of Berlin. And I say 1948, the creation of the state of Israel. It's a symbolic garden. Then the third road is the longest one. It goes to the, the road of hope, to the galleries, to the connection of the museum into the future. But you can see that it doesn't come to an atrium. It doesn't go to some space that opens. It goes towards a blank wall because to me, there is no redemption in these events. There is no hurrah. There is no something like, okay, now it's different. It's a blankness that shifts your orientation towards the galleries and makes one think about history. Thinks what is happening today? What is happening yesterday? What will happen tomorrow? And the museum spaces themselves, as you see, I have no conventional windows either. They are really the cuts those invisible lines of that star that is magnified through names of people to many places that have been erased in the history of the city. So it's, it's, it's a way to read the city, to send a message across an unknown place towards an unknown human being in the skies of a new and beautiful Berlin. And across the building, at the very center, as I said, there is no atrium. There is just a disconnected void. It's, it has six parts. You cannot enter it. It's, I call it the memory void. You just cross it with bridges. 
That's the central line of orientation of the building. And I think that's really what it's about. It's about remembering. It's about absorbing the void, the absence, and moving through it. And by the way, here I was inspired, because of my background in music, in completing, this is a very ambitious project for me, to complete an opera by Arnold Schoenberg, you know, the great composer Arnold Schoenberg, who wrote uh, opera Moses and Aaron. I don't know whether you know it. It's a fantastic opera, seldom performed. It, he wrote it in Berlin, then he was exiled, and he never completed it. He could not complete. The, the end of the opera, just at the second act, just ends with a call of Moses to God. What does it all mean? Does it have any meaning? It is silence. But I thought I could complete the third act that he could not complete in the echoes, echoes of the footsteps of the visitors across this void. You can hear the, the footsteps, and that's, to me, the completion of Arnold Schoenberg's Aaron Schoenberg's fantastic thought about what is the meaning of life, what is the meaning of history, tradition, the future. And then luckily for me, I was able to build, you know, when I first started, they didn't think anybody would come to party in the museum, to have fun, but the museum developed and now they needed a space for gatherings, for dinners, for music. So I was able to bring, to build this kind of sukkah, uh, the glass court and the Baroque uh, Altbau. Uh, very used. And very recently, across the street, I was able to use this old building, the, the old flower market in Berlin, built in the 60s, uh, which is a protected building, and put these cases, these, these, ups, these, 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 uh, these wooden cases into the building. There's an auditorium, a library, place for research. Uh, it's a, you know, for young people. People are interested. But I, the museum allowed me to do something else. Uh, I, I created a work, which you can see here illuminated. It's from one of my favorite philosophers. I don't know whether you know him, Moses Maimonides. He worked about a thousand years ago, thought about the world a thousand years ago. And he wrote in Arabic, because he lived in Egypt, he lived in Morocco, Arabic, Judeo Arabic, and I had translated it into Hebrew, into German, and into English. And it says, Hear the truth, whoever speaks it. It's a beautiful thought. Hear the truth. Whoever speaks should hear the truth. Don't just, don't just speak. Hear the truth. It's a fantastic quote, and of course, this museum is in Kreuzberg. It's not a, yeah, there's no, it's not a Jewish area, it's a Turkish area, it's an area of immigrants. So the museum has to embrace the future and speak to a new generation about history and time. And it's not a huge museum, but I'm very proud that it was adopted by the federal government as a federal project. You know, it started as a local project. It was not very easy to build it. Uh, it took a long time, but then, like the Philharmonic Orchestra, like the museums of the state, it is now under federal authority, which means that it also is a kind of ambassador of Germany and of Berlin to its own history and to the world. Okay, I'll show you another project in Germany. You might be thinking, what am I doing building a military history museum in Germany? You know, what, what could I possibly wanting to do? Why? Well, I thought about it a lot, the importance of military history in Germany and the catastrophe that Germany brought to the world in the catastrophic years is an important element. And this, you can imagine, is the largest museum in Germany. By far larger than any museum is the military history museum, which started already in the 19th century, became the museum of the Kaisers, became the museum of the Nazis, became the museum of the Soviet Union, became the museum of East Germany. And then after the unification, the question was, what do we do now? What, what, what shall we do with this museum? Well, Dresden, as you know, was one of the most beautiful cities. It was a Baroque city, totally de devastated. It was called, called the Venice of the North, with all the fantastic Baroque buildings and works of art. And then you probably even know this picture. Dresden in 1945, after the Allied bombings in 1945, completely destroyed, totally leveled towards the end of the war. And so, how does one build a building here for the military history? I decided to really create a self-similar triangle to point, first of all, at the triangulation and the points from which the airplanes, the Allied Air Force, bombed Dresden. And to have that point also, the point of view onto the new Dresden, so that you stand in a conversation of different histories you're in a new city of Dresden, 
but you're also standing in the history of the devastation of Dresden brought by the evils of Nazism and fascism. Here is the building. It, it's, it's kind of a vector that penetrates the entire building, overlooking the, uh, you know, it's a military sort of hill on which all the military installations of Dresden always were. And here is the plan. It's a cut, cutaway section of the plan. And you can see it's kind of like an arrow that has moved off center. Uh, in the horizontal plane, you have the chronology of history. You know, from the 12th century, the Teutonic Knights that were invading Poland and other places, all the way to today's German military in NATO, in Afghanistan, and so on. And this tip projects itself, just cuts the wall in two places, between the years 1914 and 1945. And those were the years, the catastrophic years, where German militarism brought such crimes and such devastations and such death, not only to Poland and not only Jews. Six million Jews perished, but 50 million others died. So many millions of Poles, Russians, so many people were murdered. So it's important in a military museum to assert that this is a museum no longer hiding the military. In a democracy, which Germany is, it's not possible to hide the military in the back. And by the way, I this was a competition. All other architects, just if you want a clue for competitions, put the building behind, like a nice glass thing behind the, the facade. But I thought, no, you have to cut the facade and you have to show that people are in front of the building. The military is marked. It's sitting there. It is the military history. It's visible in an open society. And I also restored the armory, which was very badly treated by the East Germans, was very ruined. I restored you know, the, the 19th century character of this armory. And I can show you this, that this is not a facade. It's a complete volume that moves through the opacity of the historical building and really starting from restoration and, and showing you know, the old uh, you know, Napoleonic Wars, Germany, Prussia, the building cuts everything out in its way. And you know, it's a column structure with arches, but I cut them completely out and I created a concrete structure which is oblique, which is leaning, which has a very different character of space, a very different sense of orientation. And as you go upstairs, you begin to see that there is, there is a dialogue, there is a disruption in this building that is so fundamentally centered. Uh, one of the exhibitions is, for example, Animal in War. Animals in War. I don't know whether you think about it, but you know, we think of the you know, biblical, the, the lions of Judah. We think of the, the, the elephants of Hannibal. But we seldom think of biological warfare. To what extent dogs, birds, nature itself has been taken by human beings into the violence of what the human being can do. So that's a very, very moving, very moving exhibition. And also, you can look here into the old, on the left, the old staircase. I left all the features of the building. But toys, how incredible that, we, that violence thought through toys. Interesting exhibit. It's not a very didactic exhibit. And there are not too many objects. You see the V2 rocket. They're really just emblematic. You see the helicopter, that French helicopter, just the way you should see it, in a very violent way, the way it just about to turn and, and drop. Now, this part of the museum, the central wedge, has really no exhibits proper. It has questions which are asked, questions which are asked to the public, for, in, for which there are no answers given. Why do people follow fanatical leaders? Why do people cooperate? Why do people kill on orders? Why do people march behind evil people? Its answers cannot be given to these questions, but the questions are posed for the public. And the public understands that these questions are coming from things that drop from the sky and come out of the earth and are really all around us. And then as you ascend to the upper levels of the building, you see the fragments of cities that were bombed from Dresden. You know, cities in Poland, Wieliczka, uh, uh, Rotterdam, in Holland, Coventry in the UK were all bombed from Dresden. So you see the catastrophe. And then you see this catastrophe and then you, you actually exit the museum. You go out on an oblique plane into the winds of Dresden and into the winds of history. 
And on one side, you have the beautiful view of Dresden. You have the restored Frauenkirche, you have the Baroque buildings, but you are really in the arrow. You're pointed at the first bomb, the place where the first bomb was dropped by the Allies, and the whole triangle in which the other two bombs really destroyed the city. And you're really caught in the wind of history. And you're in front of the building. You're suspended. I think this is an experience I cannot really describe in words. But you feel that you're floating in front of this military history museum, which is big and large. And it's like the West Point in the United States. That's where German officers learn about their own history, their own military history. So that's what I believe is important, to be suspended in that space, in time, and to think about it. And it's a building that is very popular now with families. It has um, uh, cinemas, it has cafe, a restaurant. So it's not for people interested in war. And probably, as a military museum, it's as close as I could build a museum of peace, although it's called the German Military History Museum. Because this is not New York, this is not Washington, it's not Paris, it's not Warsaw, it's Germany. We're at the heart of where it happened. So that's a project. Now I come to Zwota, <laughs> which is really, you know, something very personal to, for me because my mother was, you know, I was born in Łódź. My mother came from Warsaw. She actually lived on Ulica Twarda, Twarda Osiem, very close to the site in an old Hasidic neighborhood. Uh, and how strange that I was able to build this building in a city that I knew when I was a child because we used to come to visit my, uh, my mother's cousins here. Uh, you know, every month we used to take the train from Łódź and it was a big thing to come to the, to the capital, to Warsaw. And what is unforgettable for a child is always standing in front of this palace. That was like the only thing that, that you could stand in front of and take a photograph. And it was so big. And even as children, we understood that it was built to oppress the people. It was built to oppress the Polish nation. It was built by dictators to lie and to manipulate. So when I had a chance to design this building, and with Yama Karim, who's here, the principal of the building, uh, I thought a lot about the light, the symbolism, and the functionality of the building standing right next to this palace. Well, I don't have to tell you where, where it is because you know it well. It's a, a site that is important because it's really where no building stood. And yet, it's a building that is expressive. And I really believe that's important. That the building sort of goes from the ground level, from the streets, enlivening the streets, takes care in its form not to cast the big shadows on the low buildings built in the early 50s, and also a sense, and I always thought it's that to me, it's, it's, it's more the flight of the eagle in the sky, free. And I have to tell you, it's a different Poland than the one I remember. You know, I remember a dark, dingy Poland, gray, people scared, people walking silently on the streets, grayness, conformity. And now I came back to Poland, well, many years ago. Wow, it's a country of freedom, of the great culture that people have always had here in this beautiful place. So the building is, is ambitious. It's, it's not a, an extruded box. It takes various uh, uh, sort of positions in terms of where it's situated on the street, how the elevations really are sculpted in, in, in a different manner, creating a sort of a visibility through the kind of gallery on the ground floor, which will be really kind of a public space. And also I'm using some of our my designs, that's the ice chandelier, which I developed uh, in Bohemia with Lasvid company, which is kind of they're like ice. It's, it's, it's hand-blown glass, which will activate the light. And there are many great amenities for people who are lucky to live there. That this 25-meter swimming pool. There are really places uh, to enjoy, to bring your friends, uh, uh, spas, and so on. Because it's, it's not just about just a, a, an apartment. First of all, every floor is different. Every floor is just slightly different. And you can see that whether it's a small apartment or large apartment, there is always an individuality. And I really believe that, that even in a, individual, in a, in a big building where you have you know, hundreds of apartments, there should be an individual sense uh, of domestic life. And it's a conversation, it's, it's a statement. Uh, you can see that it's not that easy to build. It's a concrete structure. 
We had great engineers in Arab to create these oblique columns that hold the building. There are you know, some aspects of the vertigo in the building as well. And of course, I think it's also about sustainability because it speaks about building in the center of the city. You know, so to make a sustainable city, one has to build really in the center of the city where there's public transport, where there are things to do, where there's culture, not in the suburbs, low-rise low buildings, but really high-density center. And I'm glad that I think in the next five years, Warsaw will change. There will be many buildings, I think, uh, which uh, Warsaw will no longer be dominated uh, by, by this uh, so-called palace. I, this will become a fragment of the history of the past. And to me, what is important is that this is about people. This is not a office tower for a big company. This is not a hotel. This is not some mixed-use program. It's really for residences, for people to live. And to me, that's the highest aspiration of architecture. It's not a museum necessarily or a public building. It's how do you make a building that is interesting to live, that is well situated, that has smart technologies, that uh, stands out uh, iconically in the skyline, and that will be part of a development of the city center because it sets a certain standard of architecture. And of course, uh, as, as Warsaw develops, it will be higher, it will be a city here rather than just, and I, by the way, would suggest cutting through this huge plate of the palace of culture. There should be streets so that people can walk everywhere instead of be blocked by this large or, you know, too large Stalinist platform. Okay, another residential project uh, at, in a very different place in Singapore uh, called Reflections. Now, Singapore is a city that has a lot of great architecture and it's a city state. Uh, here too, we thought a lot about, and with Yama, uh, how can we create buildings which even though they have to be economically, you know, you're just high rise buildings, how can we make it more dense, get more height possible, create more towers which were actually not allowed on the site before, the, before we started, the height was of the lower towers, but we convinced the authorities that it is good to, to bring the density higher so that the land is more open and nature plays a greater role. You can see these towers are also doubly curved. They are not curved on one side, they are doubly curved, which means that every building in this complex stands, every floor is in a different position. It's a development of the old uh, canals at Keppel Bay. Uh, and you see my client's former project is on the bottom more like Lego blocks, you know, stamping out the same design, which I really don't think it's the best way uh, today. Uh, but it takes much more work, I have to say, to create a very, uh, very shaped housing project because you have to think of every view, you have to think of every element in the plan, and you have to design many different buildings uh, and still get uh, only one fee. So, uh, the, of course, amenities are very important. Uh, I think on this public boardwalk, cafes, places for entertainment, places to relax, uh, places that bring people and life in the evening. And I have to say, I'm very proud that in a city that has so much architecture, this was also the most profitable project in the history of Singapore. So profit, but also good architecture goes together. It's, they're not against each other. And you can see that the land, how much land was left open, how, much, uh, how important it is to, to address the, the disappearance of nature in the cities. And so we were able to leave not only the, the great peaks with gardens, which are now growing, uh, and the bridges, which have amenities and also uh, spaces there. A very, very iconic projects that define a whole area of Singapore that was kind of a dark hole and really create the momentum to say that uh, living, that's how, we, th that's how I judge cities. I don't judge cities because they have great museums. I judge cities, how well do people live in those cities? Do they have access to good housing, affordable housing? Can they live in the center of the city? And that's really important uh, for the future of cities. Now I share with you something very different. You know, never in my life was I able to design a small house. You know, I started with, you know, the Jewish Museum, and I had many museums and large-scale projects. But I had the good luck of a, a couple coming to me in New York and saying, you know, Mr. Lipskind, we'd like you to design a house. I said, are you kidding? 
You want me to design a house? They say, yes. You know, we are art collectors. We have our art collection in New York and elsewhere, but we don't want any art in the house. We would like the house to be an artwork, to inspire us. Well, it's, uh, it's a big assignment, a small house. So I started, you know, my usual way in drawing and watercolors. I show you the plan. It's a tiny house. You see the plan and you see the section, which is kind of variable. It's, it's a rather complex space for a small house. And there it is. It's about an hour away in Connecticut. But, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the house. It doesn't have to do anything with the roof, peaked roof, with chimneys, with the windows. Not at all. I wanted to create a continuous space that is very sharp, that is very abstract. And you can see that it has a monocoque construction. It has no columns. It's just self-standing, self-supporting house with insulation and so on. It, it's, the openings are just uh, kind of porches and light uh, to take uh, advantage of, you know, where is the sun in the winter? Where is it in the morning? Where is the kitchen? You know, though, that's, you know, where do you wake up? So the material here is stainless steel. And I have to tell you, you cannot really take a photograph of this house because it's always different. Sometimes it's black. Sometimes it's light blue. Sometimes it's green because there is no right angle in the house. So it reflects the environment and your approach to the house. And of course, uh, the portraits of the house uh, come forward. But inside of the house, now it's cold on the outside, like a knife, but inside it's very cozy. That's the idea. That's what I like about architecture. Should be cold on the outside, but really warm on the inside. And it's really solid oak. It's not veneer. It's thick wood. It's like a log cabin, you know, in ancient America. And my clients were so nice. They asked me to design the sofa, you know, the rug, the table, the bookcase. I had so much fun. I even designed the kitchen. And they are very good cooks. So, you know, they need good equipment and they need good light and, and entertain their friends. And, of course, the lighting of a house. You know, how, how, you know, what is the atmosphere of the house? How do you illuminate it? Uh, of course, you have to work very closely to satisfy your clients. Uh, even the shower and the bathtub I was able to make in a way, you know, I don't like the English bathtubs and, uh, you know, all that stuff. I was even able to design the faucet. You know, those faucets, I really don't like those silver faucets that everybody uses. Even the Arnie Jacobson faucet. I, I just, they, they look too much like hospital. So I designed one which is like more like a straight line. You know, it becomes a straight line. And, and it's very elegant when you stop it. You know, it's just a, just a line. I made one mistake in the house. The clients gave me a key so I could stay with Nina one weekend. They said, you can stay. Why don't you stay in the house? You have a weekend. And now my wife says every morning, why don't we have such a house? <laughs> so I have to think what to do. Uh, but it's a very cozy house. You can see it has a fireplace. It has, uh, it has a kind of a dramatic mystery. It's warm. It's luminous. And it's also like a sculpture. It's, it doesn't, you know, the neighbors were saying, what are they building here? It doesn't look like a house. But believe me, it's a house. It's a house because it's nice to live in there. And my clients just sent me this picture recently. They said, Mr. Libyan, we don't understand. Why is the house suddenly gold and purple? I said, it's the angels. I can't, <laughs> there's no way to explain this. But I don't know how, but it is. Okay, maybe the most difficult project, not only that I, but anyone could ever undertake, is what to do after the terrible destruction that changed our world, 9-11. New York. I call it memory foundations because it's about memory of what happened. But it's also a foundation for a 21st century New York. You know, very often I'm asked, and everybody knows where we were on 9-11. Maybe some of you are too young. But, you know, it's a moment that changed history. The way we travel, security, what we see on the news, on television, what's happening in the world started really on that day. That was the day and I'm often asked, Mr. Libeskin, where were you on 9-11? Well, believe it or not, after working for 12 years on the Jewish Museum, I was in Berlin. The Jewish Museum was to open to the public on that day, on 9-11-201. was the, to open to the public in, at 7.30 in the evening. It was to, the first opening to the public. And of course, by 
by about 2.38 in the afternoon, Europe, we saw those terrible images. And history changed. And the museum never opened. It never opened for three days. And I thought about it. You know, I thought a lot about history. Because you think, you know, you know about history, that history is kind of moving. And, but history is very, very complex. It, it's, it's always not really fully in our control. And that's why history is so important to me, that buildings are situated in history, but also move us to a better horizon. So that's the day. And that's, by the way, the moment when I turned to Nina and my colleagues in Berlin. At that very moment, I said, I'm returning to New York. I'm going to Lower Manhattan. They said, what? Lower Manhattan? I said, yes. I had no idea how, why, but that's what I decided. And how strange that I became the master planner of this project. It's, it's really strange. And I'll tell you even another anecdote. Some, a year later, I was called by New York City, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, and said, Mr. Liebeskin, would you like to be on the jury for, for the competition for the master plan of World Trade Center? I said, that's a great honor. Fantastic. Thank you so much. When is it? And they gave me a date. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm somewhere away in a, in a commitment, a large lecture. Can I come an hour later? No. They said, if you don't come at 9 o'clock, you're disqualified. You cannot be on the jury. And I was really sad because it was such an honor. I mean, there's only a few people to judge. And then on the other end of the telephone, the voice said, well, Mr. Liebeskind, if you are not on the jury, you could be in the competition. And so that's, yes, that's how I got the idea. Now, you know, there were many, many ideas for, for what to do. The then mayor of New York, for example, wanted only low buildings, low-rise buildings. There were many ideas. The developers wanted the big buildings, uh, you know, uh, near Wall Street. Uh, the seven finalists in the competition all had one idea. Build mega towers. The taller, the better. The more mega structure, the better. Whether it's the great uh, Lord Foster or Richard Meyer and Peter Eisenman and uh, uh, all the, all the well-known architects. They wanted to build bigger, bigger in the center. I had the opposite idea. I said, you should build nothing in the center. Because even though it's a piece of real estate, nobody declared it public territory. It's a real estate, which is expensive. I said, this should be the public realm. People should be able to have this. This is where people perish. It's not a place to build megastructures. And on the contrary, I said, instead of building you know, one big building or two buildings, that's stupid. Nobody has money to build such big buildings uh, because that's not how the economy works. I said, divide the buildings, so as many buildings as you can, five, so that they are lower, because it's better to have lower buildings in the city. It doesn't have the wind tunnels. Doesn't, it's, it's more pleasant for the streets and create a kind of a symbolic torch of liberty around on the periphery of the site and in the center, the footprints, and then go all the way to the bedrock to experience the memory of the site. I show you this not because I'm vain, not out of vanity, but to show you that the client, my cli I don't have one client. You know, who is the client? The families of those who perish, the victims. They're in the thousands of people, mothers, fathers, uncles, cousins. They're in the thousands and thousands of people. They are my first. Second of all, the Port Authority of New York a mega organization with 7,000 engineers and architects who owns the site and leases the site to private developers and their own architects. Then the governor of New York and New Jersey are in charge of the Port Authority, two very powerful governors. Mayor of New York is in charge of the streets of New York, very powerful position. And of course, the subways and the trains, the path trains that run underneath have their own authorities. So you can see that the client is thousands of people. My idea was, you have to bring a consensus, an idea how to rebuild the site that people can, can share in a democratic way. And there is my, one of my early sketches on the left, and there is the last rendering on the right. And it's, you know, it's relatively easy to shape a building, but very difficult to shape a whole neighborhood. And think about it. This is 16 acres, 16 acres, 8 acres. Half of it is public space. That's what I always thought was the key to the importance of the site. Look, my parents, you know, I lived in the Bronx. I was, you know, I lived in the Bronx. My parents were, worked in factories of New York. Very, you know, sweatshops, very tough, tough conditions. Not, not nice uh, to work. And I said, what do people of New York get? Like my parents, which are 90% New Yorkers, 99. They're 
never going to be in those towers. That's for special people who are lucky enough to work in those towers. Where will they be? They will be in the underground, on the streets of New York, running to work, running to feed their families. So it's the public realm that I'm interested. That's what I wanted to create. And that's indeed what you see here, that the site is really the largest public space created in New York's history. There is the plan. You can see Hudson River on the left. You can see all the elements, which I'll explain very briefly. But the story really is underground because that is the most difficult. You have to build all the foundations for all the buildings when you start. It's 75 feet underground and the security. And so you have to really start where, you know, when it comes over the street, it's already the easy part of the job. Uh, the slurry wall, the bedrock, which you now see through the visitor center with the fragments of the towers. You know, I have to tell you another anecdote. I was with all the final, finalist architects in a skyscraper overlooking the site in November, on, on a dark November, gray, rainy day. And somebody from the Port Authority said, does any architect want to go down to the site? And all the architects, all my friends, colleagues, famous architects in the world said, no, it's much better to look at it from, from top because you can look down, you can see the plan perfectly. But Nina and I just said, no, no, we want to go. We want to go down with those galoshes, those cheap umbrellas. You know, and as I descended down to this level of the bedrock where people perished and died, my world changed. I, I felt I had gone down to something sacred. It's, it's just this wall. And I touched it and the engineer said, you know, Mr. Lipkin, this is the slurry wall. And I didn't even know what a slurry wall was, even though I studied architecture. You know, it's a huge dam. On the left side is the Hudson River. You know, it, it's a, the, the power of the, of, the, of the ocean is on the left side. If this wall had collapsed, think about it, the waters of, of, of Atlantic would have flooded all the subways, all the undergrounds of New York. So I was kind of moved by this idea that people can build something that is strong and uh, that's really, is now really the core of uh, the museum, the 9-11 museum, which is a story not only of tragedy, but also of how good people are, so, or, are what they did on that day. And just recently, I, I had the good fortune to be with the Pope, Pope Francis, and the leaders of different religions. And I was, uh, you know, I thought about it, that the Pope chose to give his ecumenical message uh, of world peace and unity of religions in front of this wall. And I thought it was good because this wall is a foundation of the site. And usually foundations are not exposed. Usually foundations are hidden. It's very hard to expose a foundation because usually it needs a load on top of it. Uh, of course, the footprints and the waterfalls were also an idea from the very beginning. Uh, and and uh, I thought that the waterfalls were very important to bring nature to the site and also to, to have an acoustical effect to, so that it's more quiet. You know, so many cars, so, so much noise in New York. And I think this is really a very moving, a very moving tribute. You, you see the names. You can stand in the middle of the busiest city in the world and have a moment of reflection, a moment of thought. And it's beautiful. You know, it's, uh, you know, it was very controversial in the beginning. So many people, so many opinions, so many critiques, so many different points of view. But, you know, I love, uh, I love the fact that in a democracy, you can bring consensus. People can agree. And of course, it's easier to build you know, for kings who give you the land and say, do, a, do, do, do whatever you want over there. In a democracy, as Churchill, Winston Churchill, very smart man, said, you know, it's the most difficult system in the world, but it's still the only one that, that really works. So it's difficult, but really I'm a believer, and I think the, this project is a proof because it has so many uh, uh, clients, has so many people involved in it. I created an extra space. I never think there is enough space, public space in New York. Wall Street, you know, dark streets. It's, it's, it, it's, it needs, and I call it the wedge of light. It, it's a space created uh, by the shaping of the space between 8.46 in the morning, when the first tower was struck by the first airplane, and 10.28, when the second tower collapsed. So I created an extra space, and I'm really glad because it's space from Broadway. I photographed it from tower number four. So you can see that the central, uh, 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 oculus or the great uh, skylight of the pet terminal is aligned with the 1028 line and you can see the foundation on top 
of the tower number two, which is not yet built. And it'll be kind of a gate, an arrow pointing you into the memorial itself. Well, the buildings stand inside of the grid, uh, unlike the uh, former towers, which were just built, you know, in a kind of empty place. And by the way, when I went to school in New York to study architecture, we used to go down to the site as students because it was amazing. It was very controversial building these two gigantic towers in New York. And I thought a lot about it, that it's good to bring back the city, the, 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 the streets of the city, and yet surround the buildings on the periphery of the site, kind of echoing what I love is the torch of liberty. And here is, uh, you know, some satellite, uh, satellite photograph. You can see the... Uh, many things. You can see tower number one, you can see the visitor center, you can see, and here more recent, but it's really already outdated. Tower number one, the Freedom Tower, also symbolic, 1776, the date of the Declaration of Independence. You can see tower number two with its angle, you can see the PET terminal, you can see the memorial, you can see tower number three, which is already almost finished, almost to the top now. Tower number four completely finished. So, you know, it's a project underway, but I want to say, the idea of the project, what was my idea? My idea was affirmation of life. In, in, in face of the attacks against democracy, affirmation of life. And how lucky for me that 100,000 people have moved to Lower Manhattan since I started working. 100,000 people. This used to be an empty area, kind of empty at night, nobody there, just Wall Street buildings, you know, dark, like tombstones. And now it's really the hot place in New York. It's a place, it's a new neighborhood, and that is the idea of it, there is a skyline. Very soon you can see tower number one, you can see tower number four, soon you'll see tower number three. So it's about the ground level and also about the sky. And I end here, where I really began. As I said, I was an immigrant to New York. And I was probably one of the last immigrants to come by boat, because it was much cheaper later on to arrive by airplane. But I was lucky to arrive on a boat. And I was woken up by my mother, I remember, with my sister, to early in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, you're going to see New York. You're going to stand up. And we st stood on the boat, like in the movies, really. It's not, a, it's not a fabrication. All the immigrants were standing on the boat, like looking a little bit confused to see this amazing skyline, which looks like something impossible. You know, how did people do this? And then there's the Statue of Liberty, which was so big. You know, I don't know, I was 13 years old, but that Statue of Liberty looked like the Empire State Building. It was gigantic next to the ship. And later on I learned that uh, there's a poem on the Statue of Liberty by Emma Lazarus, a great American Jewish poet. She wrote, you know, give me your poor, give me your tired, give me, give me the oppressed peoples of the world who have no refuge anywhere. Come here, come to us, come to New York. This is a place where you can breathe free. And that's what the project is about. It's about freedom, it's about liberty. Thank you. Thank you very much for this lecture. Uh, I have a qu couple of questions for you. You mentioned it briefly during your presentation uh, about this void, uh, this empty space, which is quite unique for Warsaw, this 600 by 800 meters square, where we are now with this one dominant building. Uh, for the last 25, 26 years, there's been a debate going what to do with it, whether we should build super tall skyscrapers or nothing at all, or leave it to be a park or just a monument uh, about our history. What is your opinion on this place? I don't believe in destroying things. No, architecture is about buildings. I don't believe you should destroy anything. But things can be transformed to, to make life more meaningful. So my idea for, for this building would, of course, not to destroy it. Uh, on the contrary, I would renew it, I would, but I would also do some interventions that make access through this huge podium possible for people, create more connectivity in the city, and I certainly think that Warsaw will be an amazing city because more and more high-rise buildings will be built in the center where there was this void, and this is really something that Warsaw needs because Warsaw is a metropolitan capital. It's one of the capitals of the world. I think it can be done, and I'm sure it will be done. <laughs> some of the people who will be responsible for doing that are here present with us, because I noticed some of my students in architecture right now uh, here. Uh, you uh, 
during your presentation at the beginning, showed your way, your path to architecture through sketches, through drawing, through, through set design. What would be your advice be for those people who are just beginning their, their way to architecture? <laughs> well, I tell you, Oscar Wilde said that good advice is a terrible thing to give because it always fails. But what I want to say, you know, if I was to think about young architects, you know, who are full of life, full of imagination, full of talent, my message would be, don't necessarily take the highway, the biggest road possible. You, you know, you can take a small road, a path that, you know, I've never believed in the great business gurus like, you know, Bill Gates and everybody says, you know, you should have a big goal. Have a goal and then go to the goal and get to the goal. I had that different. I have a more Zen idea. Hindu, you know, don't have any goals, have a path. Now, the path is vulnerable because you can be pulled to the right or to the left, but if you stay on a path, true to yourself, not true to others, just true to yourself, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll get to destinations, places, adventures that you could never even imagine. So, of course, you have to take a risk. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to work for architects, you know, for a couple of days. You know, I, I work with great architects. You know, I, I had a job with famous architects for one or two days, and then I said, it doesn't look too interesting to me. You know, it looks a little boring. So I'll try some other technique. <laughs> so yeah, my only advice is pursue your dreams. Surround yourself with people who believe in you. Don't let yourself be surrounded by skeptics and cynics who are very often part of life. Surround yourself with a few friends who say, yeah, keep going, go, that's good and follow your dreams, basically. I think that's the only advice I have. Don't be scared, follow your dreams. Look, there is a famous uh, rabbi, Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav. I mean, there are many rabbis in my family, but this is what Rabbi Nachman said. He said, you should always pursue your dreams because the worst that could happen to you is you would not have a job. And then he said, the worst that could happen to you if you don't have a job, you could become hungry. And the worst thing that could be happen to you if you're hungry, you would die. And then he said, but everybody has to die anyway, so pursue your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> your architecture is very dynamic, very expressive. Uh, and sometimes also very poetic as you, uh, as you, as you describe those uh, museums that you have designed. How do you persuade commercial, residential developers to be brave, to be courageous, enough to build something iconic and something very expressive with their own um, private money? Well, I have to say, very often there is a, a perceived sense of antagonism because, you know, between architects and developers, as if developers lived in kind of another world against good architecture. But if you're able to convince a developer that it's better, that it's, it's better to do something, to take that risk. Maybe you have to do it not with words, but with drawings, with facts, with science. But I think, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to work with many uh, developers around the world. You know, we work on every continent. And I think people are brave. They take decisions. I don't think it was very easy to build Zwota. And it, you know, there was an economic decline, you know, when the building started. And, you know, it had a, a very rough path. But I think, if you're able to create something that has real value, which is not just an imitation of something, but has some originality of what you want it to be, I think developers will be with you. And look, uh, my greatest uh, uh, parable about it is World Trade Center, where the developers were against five buildings. They were against open public space. They wanted a small memorial and many buildings in the center of the site. But at the end, the developers kind of became my friends. They understood this was actually better for them. And having so many people move to the neighborhood is great for business, for hotels, for restaurants, for retail, uh, and for the community in, at large. So yes, that's how I would do it, how I did it. Uh, I have just one final question about Zwota, uh, Zwota 44. Uh, this was a building that was met with much expectations on part of the public, on part of the architects who watched it grow uh, with some turbulence, as, as you probably know for, for, for yourself best. Uh, and yes, it was a building that was expected to be iconic. 
which in, in, in some sense was part of a controversy when it was finally finished. Uh, do you, what, what do you expect it to look? And were you surprised when you said, so it finished? Did, you, uh, did it feel, fulfill your expectations? Look, if an architect treats a building as an experiment, it's a bad building. It's like a piece of music. You know, if you're a musician, as I was, you can't hope that you will play, you know, Toccata in D minor correctly. You either play it correctly or you're an idiot. You know, so you have to be able to be precise. You have to know exactly what you're building. You also have to be open to changes of technology. Of course, you have to, there's some flexibility because even technology changes, for example, glass changed during the time we were designing the building, glass manufacturing. Uh, so, yes, you, it's, it's really what I expected. Actually, it's even better because it's built. <laughs> because there's one thing is to expect something, like expecting a child. But another thing, when you see a child, and I have three of them, you see that a child has his own personality or her own personality. And that personality happens after that, you know, when the building starts being occupied by people who are actually living there. So to me, the architecture really hasn't started yet. It starts where people move to the building, when people will, you know, cook a meal, when they'll, you know, take a shower, they meet their neighbors. That will be the beginning of the social life of the building. And of course, architecture is about social life. At the end, it's not about concrete and steel and glass. It's about people and, you know, what they do and what they think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, the speech.